Hi, everyone, and welcome to this mini lecture on instruction. Our goal here is to cover three different instructional approaches and to identify some factors that contribute to high quality instruction. So first, what do we mean by instruction? In a previous lecture, I mentioned the word pedagogy and said it was the how of teaching. I also said curricula was the what. Let's look at this a bit closer. Our textbook authors, Kaplan and Owings, say pedagogy is the art of teaching and includes instructional strategies, management techniques, and curriculum. So this definition is a bit more encompassing. They further distinguish instruction as the teacher's actions that bring the curriculum to life. So instruction is part of the larger construct of pedagogy. The three instructional approaches we will discuss here are based on learning theories, where learning is defined as the complex cognitive processes that happen when experience produces a change in knowledge or behavior. We will look at the behavioral approach, the cognitive approach, and the constructivist approach. You may already be familiar with one or more of these approaches or remember that we touched on constructivism in a previous lecture. So first, the behavioral approach. This approach is influenced by psychologist B.F. Skinner, whose work defined learning as a change in behavior brought about by experience. For Skinner, behavior is what a person does in a given situation. Skinner used operant conditioning to test his hypotheses, which many of us have probably heard or read about. Of course, we don't treat students like lab animals, but teachers use sophisticated stimulus response instructional techniques. Let's take a look. A behavioral instructional approach is grounded in stimulus response principles that begin with setting clear and specific goals. These goals inform teachers specifically about what students will do, about the desired behavior they want to see. Content is broken down into steps and teachers provide clear and systematic praise when students show positive behavior by correctly demonstrating what they have learned. Teachers praise and encourage students, which acts as positive reinforcement. Teachers adapt the consequences to fit quote unquote misbehavior or behavior that is not demonstrating the desired learning. There is a program used in many schools around the country called PBIS or Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. Maybe some of you attended a school in which PBIS was in practice. Behaviorism may sound a bit simplistic or like training, but I've learned there are important and beneficial uses of behavioral approaches in counseling and special education. Some of the critiques of behavioralism include the argument that this approach is not appropriate for complex learning, only simple learning, that there is little or no room for creativity, and that behaviorism is a passive learning approach, that students are empty vessels that teachers fill with knowledge. Next, let's look at the cognitive approach. This approach emerged as a response to behaviorism and is really concerned with students' thinking. The cognitive model is based on the analogy between the mind and a computer, sometimes called the information processing model. Cognitivism is about thinking or processes of the mind. It is distinguished from behaviorism, which is not concerned with thinking but with outward actions. With a cognitive approach, knowledge students bring to learning is crucial. New information is connected with prior knowledge to build learning. Cognitive practices include activating background knowledge, focusing on the most important information, connecting new knowledge to what students already know, 
doing a lot of reviewing and repeating and teaching learning strategies. Scholars critique cognitive approaches, suggesting they do not account for outside influences, such as SES, race, and gender. Additionally, students' background knowledge can be diverse, making the task of activating this knowledge difficult or exclusive of those with diverse backgrounds. Finally, we'll look at the constructivist approach. Constructivism suggests that learners create their own new understandings based on an interaction between what they already know and believe and information and ideas with which they come into contact. Learning is a self-regulated process of making meaningful connections between the familiar and the new. Learning takes place all the time, not only in school. And students remember and learn what they find most relevant. Some constructivist practices include giving students choices, designing problem-based activities, and having students apply new knowledge in creative ways. The main critiques of constructivism are that it puts students' interests before important content that must be taught. Some scholars argue that it is not a teaching approach, but a learning theory. Still, other scholars suggest it is a Western and first world teaching practice not appropriate for all contexts. So, moving on, Regardless of the teaching approach, there are certain markers of high quality instruction. First and foremost, quality instruction must be designed and well planned. Teachers must have thorough knowledge of their content areas and of pedagogy. Finally, high quality instruction takes into account who students are. Our textbook authors suggest these are some marks of high quality instruction. It creates a culture for learning. It manages time and resources of the classroom. It is about communicating effectively with students. And it involves a reflective practice on the part of the teacher, one in which the teacher is always evaluating, learning, and revising. That's all. I'm going to leave you here for now, equipped with some basic knowledge about instructional approaches and indicators of high quality instruction.